Hey, thank you so much for joining us today at Cowboy Junction Church Online. We're sure glad that you did. We hope that today's message will encourage you and challenge you as you connect passionately with the word that God has specifically for you. Would you do me a big favor, rate, review, and subscribe to this message. Also, I wanna let you know that if you would like to connect with Cowboy Junction, get our text messages and with encouragement and announcements, you can do so by texting the word CONNECT to 575-209-2770. You could also rate, review, and subscribe. That sure would be helpful to us. If you would like to partner with Cowboy Junction in the spreading of the gospel by financially giving, you can do so by going to cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. I hope you enjoy the message. Hey guys, I want to thank you so much for being here. We're going to kick off this love series. And this series, what we're about to study, is so important to me. And I, I want it to be important to you. Because at Cowboy Junction, we believe that this series will teach us that if you know God, you'll know love. But the only way to know love is to know God. We hope that after this message, you will have a whole new way to view the heart of God and love. So sit back and enjoy. Today is the last and final day of the love series. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. We'll do it again someday, I promise. But everywhere you look in Scripture, there is this, there is this residue of a rhythm, if you will, of God's personality. And if God had a, has a personality, it would be love. But it's not love in the form of what the world would say love is, in that everybody needs to need to be accepted. We just need to love everybody the way that they are. Come on, love, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is one of the best definitions of what God's personality is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not rude or boastful or keep records of wrong. All the things love is and all the things love is, and it closes with this one thing. Love never fails. Okay? For the last several weeks, we've been talking about all the reasons why this is important to me. Because let me just tell you a quick, quick little story. This love changed me. It, to, to just give you an example, my entire life, I saw God as an abusive father. Okay? And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it. But I grew up in church, was raised in church, go down the list. I, I was a great kid. I believed that if I died, I was going to go to heaven. I knew about the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. I knew, I, 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 man, I would read my Bible. I'd pray. But in the back of my mind, I always saw God as always looking at his watch, wondering why it always took me longer to get stuff than it took other people. I always saw God with his hand back. At any moment, if I was to do something wrong, I just saw God ready to just pop me in the back of the head. And in my mind, I was like an abusive kid abused kid I, I just thought it's my fault I deserve it you're so dumb Ty you're so ridiculous and this is this is ridiculous this kind of thinking and if you're in the room and you're like I kind of feel the same way about God well, we've been talking about that because a friend cornered me one day and he said why do you see God like this and he began to give the definition of love found in first Corinthians chapter 13 and it changed my life. I'm a completely different person than I was back then uh, because I see God in a completely different way. And we've been talking about throughout the weeks what love is, what love isn't, and now we're going to do something that I couldn't wait to get to. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus is giving a bunch of parables. Parables are stories that he's telling to kind of prove a point, to kind of give us a little in, in, inside look at something deeper. It's like telling a great story and understanding the aha moment in it. He's talking about the kingdom of God. Specifically, he's talking about how his father kingdom, kingdom operates, but he's more specifically talking about what his father is like. Okay? When we say father, we're talking about God. Okay? So a lot of connections are taking place here as we know that love is God, and we know that the father is God, and Jesus is talking about both. And so he, in Luke chapter 15, starts off with a few parables. Some of my favorite parables of all time is in here. In fact, he starts off in Luke chapter uh, 15, and he, he talks about what's known as the sheep story. Maybe you've heard this story. It's a story of a shepherd. Jesus says, once upon a time, there was a shepherd. And this shepherd had a hundred sheep. But one day, he was counting sheep as they were coming to the sheepfold. And he goes, 97, 98, 99. 
and they were missing one sheep. Now, logic would say, you've got 99. Keep them, because that's where the value is. And Jesus says, that's not how my father is. My father put everybody into the sheepfold, locked it up, made sure they were safe, and then he grabbed a flashlight and he headed out to look for the one sheep. And the story is this beautiful story of the shepherd, the good shepherd, that was willing to leave the 99 to go after the one, to rescue it. It goes against everything we think of as humans in, in, in understanding what makes sense. Why would you leave the 99 after the one? And Jesus says, that's the whole point. When you know my father, you'll know his love for that one lost sheep. Okay, it, it, in the story, it closes like this. It says, I say to you that likewise there are more, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. That, that's one of the coolest statements in that story. From the sheep story, you find the coin story. So this is Luke chapter 15, sheep story, coin story. And Jesus says, once upon a time, there was a, a person who had nine or had 10 gold coins, precious gold coins. And one day they just pulled them out and they just began to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And they're missing one. And he said, what do you do when you're missing one gold coin? Do you sit there and hold the nine and say, you know what? At least I got these nine. You know, at least these nine are, are, are valuable and I've got a, a lot in here. It says that that, that that person flipped the house upside down, checked every crack, every crevice, checked in between the seats, you know, where the French fries fall into. This is New King James, French fries. <laughs> and, 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 and right there with, you know, dug through the trash, pulled the trash out, dug through the trash, searched the entire house until they found that one coin, okay? And Jesus says, how much more valuable do you think you are to our Father in heaven Amen. to see the value in you to go, willing to go look for you? And this is how the story closes with the coins. Uh, you have the story about the, the sheep and leave. You have the coins of search. Jesus, is, God's willing to search for you. But in Luke chapter 15, 10, it says this, likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. What sinners are we talking about today? Uh, I want you to think of something real quick. What does a sinner look like in your mentality? Okay, so come on, it's okay. Think about it. Think about it. What, did, what do you think a sinner is? What do you? Th what, how do you envision a sinner? I want you to hold on to that thought because now I'm going to take you from the sheep story and the coin story to the story about the sons. Yep. That's what it has to do with, the sons. This is the sons of the good father. In literally, literally, in literary, in book history, <laughs> in book history, short stories all across the world, the story of the prodigal son is referred to as one of the greatest short stories the world has ever known. The story you're about to hear, if you've never heard it for the first time, has been told all over the world, and some of the greatest artists have painted paintings by the inspiration of this story. Uh, there's been songs written about this story. There's been people that's lives were changed because of this story. But it makes us ask a question. What is a sinner, and what's the father's view of someone who rejects him. I want to read you this story. It goes like this in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Let's just go with me here today, okay? If the message is awful, at least there's brisket uh, uh, nachos, okay? But I think this is going to be fantastic. Here we go. Then he said, who's he? Jesus. This is Jesus telling the story. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled the stomachs with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him 
anything. But when he had come to his, himself, when he had come to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I am perishing with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he arose and he came to his father. But he was still a great ways off. His father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. I added that part. And the son said to him, Father, 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 I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and, and, and bring a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. But now, his older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house. And he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and said, uh, What's these thing, what do these things mean? And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you, and I never, I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, your, as this son of yours came, who has devoured our livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you're always with me. You're always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Father, today I thank you for the reading of your word. And I pray that you would open our ears to hear. Someone needs to hear this story. And I pray that it would show us what love really is. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember, we're talking about love. We're talking about what is real love. And in exploring what love is, we are exploring what God is. We're seeing all the things we've talked about in the last several weeks come to a place to where every one of us is able to now say, I know what my father is like. And one of the things we believe according to Romans, and we'll get to it here in a minute, and Romans tells us it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Did you hear that? It's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. The thing that Jesus is saying in this story is, number one, he tells about the father. And Jesus, make no mistake about it, is saying the, story, the father in this story is an amazing father. He is a good father. He loves his children very much. He is very good at sowing, and he's very good at reaping. He's very good at having goodness, and he's a good businessman. This is a man that not only can keep his household in order and be the kind of father that he needs to be, but he can also invest and have an investment return a, 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 a payment. And, and he has gained great wealth by being a good businessman. He saves well, he spends well. And he has been able to bring an inheritance to his sons. Now we got to know through Scripture 
And a good father, according to Old Testament, says that he will leave an inheritance for his son's sons. It's several generations of young men that will receive an inheritance from the proper saving and spending from a good father. So this guy, according to Jesus, is doing everything he's supposed to do. But you know as well as I do, for all the dads and moms in the room, sometimes you can be a good dad, and sometimes we sow what we reap when it comes to our kids, and sometimes we can do everything right, and there's still rebellious children that come. Jesus brings up this point. If I had to give a title to this message today, it's not the story of the two sons. Stay with me. It's the story of the three sons. And I'll explain the third son here in a minute. But Jesus shows the real heart and love of the Father, which should give you an idea on what your God is like and how he responds to you when you don't choose him, when you don't want him, or you don't like the things that he does and you have questions as to why he does it. But to set this off, we see that Jesus says, this was a good father, and your father in heaven is a good God too. But then he starts the story of the rebellious son. And he starts this story of a young man who in all intents and purposes is very immature. Immature both spiritually and mentally. He may be a grown man. He may be somebody who is physically at full capability. But he is immature in the decisions he makes, the choices he makes, and his spiritual life as well. He's a man-child is basically what it boils down to. And then he does the unthinkable. What would be the unthinkable? He turns to the father and he says, I want my inheritance. Now, to really get an idea on this, it's not just a money thing. Because you know inheritance like I know money. It doesn't come until your parents have passed away. So let's put this together and show you just how immature and awful this young man is. He is literally turning to his dad and saying, you're better dead to me than alive. I hate you. I don't want you in my life anymore. The best scenario for my life is if you would just die and I can take what's mine. But that doesn't look like it's going to happen. So I'll take the second best thing and I'll just turn to you and say, give me what's mine. You're dead to me. And as a dad, this is unthinkable. I can't imagine my kids turns into me. But the reason why this is such a pause moment, do you realize every time we choose something else other than God, we are saying, I don't want any part of what you want for my life. I don't want you to think about this. It's that big a deal. Anytime God is a good father, anytime God is is there for us. Anytime God has a plan set aside, anytime God has built an inheritance for us to step into, do y'all realize we're not the first people on the earth to have a choice to honor God, to live by his ways and to know his best for our life. And we are stepping into an inheritance that goes way beyond anything we've ever done. We don't deserve it, but it's a father's love. And when we choose something other than God's best, we're actually saying, my freedom is more important than submitting to your authority. I want to be me. I want to go be me. I want to experience all that I want to do. And I don't want a relationship with you. This is what God deals with every day. For those in the room that you would say, well, those kind of people, they just deserve what they get. I know what you're saying, but that's not how the story goes. In fact, one of the saddest parts about here is the father gives him what he's asking for. He has to liquidate everything, and the son walks away. Time out. Think about that. The son walks away. Anytime we choose our freedom, our expression, our sexual choices, our decisions without stopping and realizing we're really walking away from God's best. We 
like this rebellious son, have experienced a walk away as well. We walk from being free of sin to being and choosing to be free to sin. And then a famine hits. Bam. A famine hits. Oil prices crash. The economy tanks. Awful things happen to investments. Things cost more. And this young man, we can see, didn't go get a job, but he continued a living to where he bought anything he wanted, did everything he wanted to do. And it gets him to a point to where he loses everything. In fact, it comes to a point to where he has to go to work at a pig farm. Now, this is a very big symbolism here. Jesus, who is Jewish, is telling to a bunch of Jewish people a story about a Jewish young man, and he says things got so bad that he had to go to work feeding pigs. Now, for Jewish people, you didn't eat pig, you didn't hang around pig, you didn't have pet pigs, you didn't feed pigs, just to show how bad it can get. Maybe you know someone, or maybe you are someone, who would say it's pretty bad right now. But then he came to his senses. In the pig pen, he says, what am I doing here? I mean, is this how I want to die? I mean, do I want to be an old man someday and this is the best life is because of the dumb choices I've made? And it says he comes to his senses. Do you know that as a church, before you even walked in here, for anybody in the room that you're like, I don't even know how I got here. I mean, I drove by the place and I saw Baja Grill was out there and I thought, hey, I could do lunch. And they invited me to come in and I came in and I'm here. I'm just glad you're here. But sometimes we can look at our lives and say, I believe God is good. I don't know if he can ever restore me. And I would turn and say, you need to hear this story more than anyone today. That this story is about the redemption of God. And even a young man who came to his senses, which we're asking you today, we've been praying that, that you would look at this differently and that you would come to your senses. Do you want to live like this for the rest of your life? And he didn't. But he never thought he could be a son again. He thought, maybe I could be a servant. So he practices the speech, Father, I've sinned before God and you. Please forgive me. I want to be one of your servants. Repentance is any time we get a chance to turn around. And we see that this son knew that his dad was a good dad and would at least let him be a servant. So this young man comes home. And what he doesn't know is the father's been looking for him ever since he left. Now they've heard reports. They've heard reports about Bad choices. They've heard report, reports about him being strung out, homeless, being with wrong people. And he couldn't go after his son just yet, but he could look for his son. And when he looked over the horizon on one particular day, he saw someone coming over the horizon with a walk that he recognized, with a gait that he recognized, and he knew it was his son. And then something interesting happens. And let me show you this. For everybody that thinks you could never be forgiven, or maybe you're here today and you go, I could never forgive them. It says here that the father ran. In Eastern culture, this is completely unheard of. According to Scripture, he could do three things to his son. He could disown his son he could beat his son and even according to deuteronomy chapter 21 he could kill his son all of these were acceptable punishments for someone who turned from his father and disrespected his dad and brought shame on his dad but this father this father welcomes his son in fact to get this visual in your mind i want you to think about an Eastern Jewish dad in a robe running to his pig stinking son. And let me show you what it might look like. I thought about wearing Heather's bathrobe for you today. I thought that'd be a bad idea, okay? So just get the visual of an Eastern dad in a cloak and having to pick it up like this to be able to run to his son. The reason why I want you to see this is you have a dad 
who according to Eastern culture says, you don't have to do anything. He should at least bring a gift. And we know he's too poor to bring a gift anymore. This kid's in shame. This kid is in desperate need of help. And you see a dad not sit there and wait for him to come beg. In fact, the kid doesn't even get a chance to even get the practice sentence out of his mouth, and the dad runs to him. You know what this is called? Grace. He doesn't have to, but this is what a dad does. Not only does he run, but it says that he hugs. And it says that after he hugs him, he kisses him. Dads, every dad in this room, every single dad in this, every single man in this room that wants to be a dad someday. Let me turn and show you the importance of looking here, what God does to his children. He hugs them and he kisses them. And it's very important for us to do that to our kids too. Kiss your kids. Kiss them everywhere on the cheeks, Dad. Sneak up behind them when they get too big for you and bear hug them and kiss them on the back of the ear. Be cool about it. Like if he makes an interception, don't run on the sideline and rip his helmet off and kiss him. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's just not cool. But dads, we got to be tough and tender. we got to be tough and tender. We see here that this father had compassion, compassion and he celebrated. And the interesting thing about compassion and celebration is the community goes the way the father's going to go. And if the father rejects his child, then the community will reject the child. And this is a story for the church. It's a story for every person in the room wondering, what do we do with people who make stupid choices? Cost our community dearly. What do we do with people that know the right way and don't choose it? You simply do what the Father does. And the community responds to what God is doing for a rebellious son who comes back home. We have compassion and we celebrate. And then it says that he lavishly brought gifts to him. Put rings on his finger. Bring the notary republic. Let's give this guy all the bank account needs he needs give him a credit card put clothes bless him and most of us go whoa, whoa 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 he blew the inheritance but even this father says he's got to be able to buy gas for his car the kid's got to eat come on we reinstate you with all the rights and privileges of not a servant but a son and some people have a problem with it segue into the next person the very person who had a true problem with it, the older son. Remember this story, this, today's message is about my three sons. And the second son, the older son, was out in the field working. And he heard the music. And he came in and a servant said, your brother came home, your brother came home. Oh my gosh, he finally came home. And the son, the second son, the older son, wasn't a rebellious son but he was a religious son. And the religious, religiosity, go with me here, I just made that word up, would say, it, so we're going to throw him a party? And he walks up and he refuses to walk in. The story specifically said that the father had to come out to talk to his religious son. He said, I've been doing all the work since he left. Since he left, my workload's been two times as much. He's been partying with friends, buying drinks for everybody. Who knows who you've been sleeping with? But I've been watching the sheep. I've been doing the work twice as much as, he da as dad. He dishonored you. But what he didn't realize was he was dishonoring his father. In fact, three times. He was self-righteous and indignant towards his father. It says in Scripture, but as soon as this son of yours who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf. Three times pointing at his father. I can just see it with my mind. And that's what religiousness does. It's saying, I'm better than him. I've checked off my list. I've done everything you've told me to do. And you're throwing a party for him. And then he does the unthinkable. With an invitation from his father, to, come on. Don't you realize my family's back together? The older son, the religious son, turns and says, no, 
no, I'm not going in. And rejects the invitation from the father. The father turns to him and begs, come on, would you please come to the party? I, just, I don't condone what your brother did. I don't say it was good. If you're worried about the money, if you're worried about the money, I just want you to know, the two-thirds left over, because I gave him a third, because Jewish custom says that the older son got two-thirds and the younger got one-third, the two-thirds is safe and sound. You're going to be great. Everything I have is yours. If you're worried about the money, don't worry about the money. You just have to understand, I just got my boy back, and my family's here. And even with that plea, the religious son said no to the dad. We're wrapping up this series of love, and I'm just, gosh, 10 minutes away from being done, seven minutes. And I have a question for you. After hearing the whole prodigal son story and then looking at it a little bit deeper, every person in this room is somewhere. And my question is, which one of the sons are you? It's not being judgmental, but it is going to shine a light on how much you know of the father, what do you know about love, and how much of the father are you like? For me, I kind of lean on the side of being a little religious. Yes, there's a softer side to me, a gray side. That, that, that's God's alarm saying you got to wrap it up, Ty. <laughs> I struggle. I struggle with being the one that's kept the rules, done the things, obeyed every commandment, I get frustrated when I think of all the people working the system, rebellious. But one of the things I forget in my religiosity is how rebellious I was at one time. And so to talk to you, to wrap this up, it's interesting where we all stand. Because the religious think we're right next to God's heart. And the rebellious think they'll never be close to God again. And let me show you a few things. In this room, you're either rebellious or religious. And one of the things about the rebellious is we have a desire to be free and to make our own choices. And sometimes we just really boil it down to we don't like to be told what to do. The flip side is you can be religious and think that's the best way to live. If I can have someone tell every one of us how to live and you just give me a cheat sheet and I can just go and just mark off everything to do, I know at the end of the day I fulfilled my duties as a son and anybody else that didn't do their part, they can't consider themselves a son. And both are wrong. The same side is true to when it comes to the freedom and it really boils down to sometimes we can call our creativity and our desire to be different lazy. And we end up on the religious side saying, why is it that they get to be them and we have to pick up their mess? And the flip side is sometimes the rebellious have a visible sin and the religious seem to have an invisible sin. There are things in me that I want you to know you will never, ever see, but in the middle of the night they wake me up because I get angry and I get mad and I get ticked off at people and I just wish God you would strike them with a lightning bolt to wake them stinking up and everybody laughing has experienced that religiosity too yes everybody else not laughing is like dang you religious people are crazy y'all need to come y'all need to come party with us okay hang on do y'all know that when it comes to uh, religion we uh, find that uh, the liberal, the, the, uh, the, the rebellious call themselves liberal, and we find that the religious call themselves conservative. And the conservative thinks that the word liberal is the most awful word in the whole world. And the liberal seem to think that the conservatives are just a back, bunch of backwoods, 
uh, cousin Marion, uh, uh, self-righteous hypocrites. And then you find that the rebellious, they use people. But the religious judge people. Use people in the form of, look at the story to where the young, rebellious son used his father. But then all of the rebellious son's friends used the rebellious son until he didn't have anything. But then the judging people of, I've been watching the sheep and I've been doing everything you told me to do. And I, I, I'm still a virgin and I, I, I save my money and I go to church and, and we can be self-righteous judging people. Uh, we find that the rebellious, rebellious are, are, tend to be a little unrighteous when we find that the religious are often self-righteous. And here's the bombshell. I don't know how you've ever read this story and thought who would be wrong, but the truth is both boys used their father. One son used the father to get the freedom that he always wanted. And the other son used the father to build his own personal view on life and empire. But the fact was is that neither son loved the father. And that's a very important message to preach in church. Because it tells the rebellious, you are far from your father. But he has been looking over the hill ever since you left and will you ever get to the point to know how much the father loves you to come back home the choices you're making will never lead to his best for your life when we keep being rebellious and expressing ourselves and wanting ourselves to be out there and and we celebrate the individualistic of ourselves and I choose this and this is me but we're saying no to our Father. We're saying, I wish, I wish you would just leave me and my friends alone. But a good Father will never give you that. He will keep knocking on your door and He will keep looking for you until finally you need to know that He has given you room to come back home. And that's love. And that's love. And it's also this moment that we understand that the religious actually don't love the father either because they don't celebrate what he celebrates. And they think that the family business is growing the empire and we need more sheep and we need more barns and we need to be doing more. But the religious need to stop and realize, do you actually celebrate what God celebrates? He could care less about the building. He could care less about the time or the color of the carpet. He could care less about our religious traditions. If we take our focus off our family and put it on ourselves and we grow in our self-righteousness, you will never know the heart of the Father. And this whole story, remember the story of the title today? my three sons is we see the rebellious and we see the religious but there's a third son in the story and the third son is actually the son who is the closest to the father and he's the one telling the story his name is Jesus and he starts off with saying a man had two sons And he's telling it from the standpoint of, when you know me, you'll know the Father. When you know me, you'll know love. When you know me, you'll understand what it means. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says this, For he, that's Jesus, made him, that's God, who made him, which is Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. Can you think about that for a minute? Jesus, who knew no sin, didn't get religious. He said, Dad, whatever we need to do to get him home. 
whatever we need to do to change his hard heart, whatever we need to do to get him out of the pig pen, whatever we need to do to get his focus off of his personal empire and self-righteousness, to get us back to, I will give my life so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the actual story of my three sons. And it's the story of where I want to be. So I find myself in this spot to where I've made some really good choices to serve Jesus. But God keeps pulling me back and saying, yeah, you did because I made a way when you didn't have a way. And remember how rebellious you were back in the day? And I made a way for you to get to me. And I find myself right in the spot of the third son. That's where we all should be. If you're in this room and you struggle with just being just mad at the world and mad at politicians and mad at the ways that stupid people make dumb decisions and you're sitting there and you're just bitter and you're angry and it could be from your religious self-righteousness that we've got to stop and realize that our God looks at this earth and doesn't want to curse it but he's actually celebrating it saying there's somebody that you can go love. Would you come to the party? Christians need to be better at partying. Now, take it easy for a minute, okay? <laughs> you know, you know uh, we need to party when people come back to the Lord. Yeah. There needs to be Taco Tuesday for every person that accepts Christ as their Savior at Cowboy Junction. And it's just like, hey, what are you doing? I, I got to go to church. It's noon. I know, it's Taco Tuesday. <laughs> We're celebrating three people who accepted Christ as their Savior. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> But the only way we're going to get to celebrate is for when that person in the room right now that's going, I don't know, I don't like church people. I don't know. They don't like me. I mean, I, I made some choices, and they're sitting there talking to themselves going, I know they don't like me. Well, stop for a minute. How do you like to taste a pig slop when your father isn't asking you to come to church? He's asking you to come home. You may be the toughest guy in the room. You may be the toughest female. I've gotten to two fights in my life. There were two big girls. I lost both fights, okay? <laughs> but I'll turn to you and I'll tell you this. God, even in my religiousness, has brought me to a place today to turn to you and say, as your big brother, we've really missed you. Our family's not the same without you. You've been gone way too long. We got this other brother, Jesus, who gave his life so that you could come back home. Dad wants you back. I was sent here today to tell you, would you just come back home? It's not about church. Forget how you show up. Dad's got new clothes. He's got a ring he wants to give you. We're not worried about you getting cleaned up. Come with all the issues. We'll pay for rehab, whatever we got to do. Can you just come home? 